offering my pranams at Swami's lotus feet. Sairam and good morning to one and all. We may meet many spiritually evolved people in our lives. We may also come across those who stand as intellectual pillars in various disciplines of life. But rare is the opportunity to meet those of an elite class who stand at the junction where spirituality meets substance. We have a speaker who has both a philosophical and a scientific bent of mind. It is my proud privilege today to introduce to you all one such instrument of our Swami, Dr. Srikant Sola. I was given Dr. Sola's CV yesterday and I can honestly say that I can speak through the entire moral class only on his CV. But I have done my best to abridge it which definitely does not do justice to sir. Dr. Sola hails from Vijaywada, Andhra Pradesh. He had moved to the United States where he began his medical career with a gold medal at the Lawrence County High School, Kentucky. He went on to finish his bachelor's in biosciences at the prestigious Stanford University in 1993. He went on to get his MD with a gold medal from the University of Louisville School of Medicine. Sir then went on to complete his, his residency in internal medicine at the reputed Duke University Medical Center, acclaimed all over the world. He then became the Chief Fellow, Division of Cardiology at the Emory University School of Medicine, 2005. He was associated with internal medicine at the Stanford University Med School and with clinical cardiology at the Harvard Med School in 2007. Sir, before returning to India, was associated with the Cleveland Clinic, Ohio, which is reputed all over the world for its great healthcare services. Dr. Sola has innumerable honors, publications, and merits to his name. He is a recipient of the Lang Medical Publications Award, 95. Association of Pathology Chairs Honor Society Award, Letitia Shelby Kimsey Taylor Award for Excellence in Medical Microbiology, Dr. Herbert Wald Phi Delta Epsilon Scholarship Award, Peter K. Nofull Award in Pharmacology. He won the first place thrice in the Young Investigator Awards. He also featured in the Who's Who in America and also in Who's Who in Science and Engineering. Sir is also named as one of America's top cardiologists by the Consumers Research Group of America. He has to his credit over 30 publications in peer-reviewed journals and over 40 scientific abstracts presented at different international conferences. Dr. Sola has also authored book chapters and he has ongoing research collaboration with the Department of Biotechnology and National Institute of Health and is also an editor and reviewer for journals related to cardiovascular diseases, diagnosis and therapy. Dr. Sola and his family were drawn back by Swami and is currently the consultant cardiologist at the Sri Satsa Institute of Higher Medical Sciences Whitefield since 2008. Dr. Sola has a wealth of spiritual experiences and has given many talks about the insights into meditation and spirituality even in our hostel. I request all of you to join me in welcoming Dr. Srikant Sola to share his thoughts and wisdom with us. Dr. Srikant Sola. Humble pranams at the lotus feet of our beloved Bhagavan, respected elders, dear teachers, beloved students, my loving sidearms to you all. It's always a pleasure to be able to speak before Swami students. Many of you may not be aware of this, but you're held in very high regard by many across the world for your selfless devotion to Swami, your sterling character, and your simple humility. 
for the students. It's always a pleasure to be before you for the lecturers and teachers in, in general. It's always a pleasure to be before Swami's teachers. For the students, where will you find such exemplary teachers today? You won't. You would have to go all the way back to probably Treta Yuga to get some such teachers. So it's no surprise then that when I was asked to speak, I asked the students for what they would like me to speak on, and they said, sir, in today's world where Swami's physical form is no longer there before us, how can we connect to Swami within us? And so with your permission, that is what we'll discuss for uh, this morning. Now, when I thought of this topic, for, for me, connecting with Swami inside has been my spiritual path. You see, as you heard during the introduction, I grew up in the United States. All of my education was there. And so my connection to Swami was always from 10,000 kilometers away. So I had to learn to rely on the inner Swami, the inner Sai. And so I'll just share with you some insights on what I have learned across the way. These are very simple things that can be practiced by anyone. I'll divide the talk into three topics. The first is connecting with the inner Sai. The second is experiencing the universal Sai. And the third is delving deeper into the teachings of Sai. So that's what we'll talk about uh, this morning, if that's okay with you. The first topic, connecting with the inner Sai, is actually very simple, but there's both good news and bad news about how to do this. And so I'm reminded of a story. This is a doctor story, so please uh, bear with me. But once there is a patient who had gone to see his doctor. He wasn't feeling very well. The patient was not feeling very well. So he said, let me get an executive health checkup and see what is there. So he got a whole battery of tests. The doctor frowned when he saw the results and he ordered another battery of tests. But those tests would take some few days to come back. So the doctor told the patient, uh, you go back home and I'll give you a call in a few days if there's anything wrong. If you don't hear from me, know that everything is okay. So three, four days went by and the man got a call from his doctor. The doctor said, well, sir, I'm afraid I have good news and I have bad news. Which one would you like to hear first? And the man thought, he said, well, sir, give me the good news first. And so the doctor said, well, the good news is you have 24 hours left to live. The patient thought, hey, 24 hours? Sir, if this is the good news, then what is the bad news? And the doctor said, the bad news is I was supposed to call and tell you about this yesterday. So when it comes to connecting with the inner side, there is both good news and bad news. The good news is that it is very, very simple. The bad news is that it takes quite a bit of effort. So let me just go through some simple steps that will take care of that effort. I remember once, uh, years ago, one of my family members was complaining to Swami during an interview. She was saying, Swami, Srikant, you know, he says he's always getting messages from you and he follows only that advice. Even we try to tell him something, whatever we tell him, first he'll check with you and then only he'll act. So Swami said to her, says, yes, that is correct. Where do you think those messages are coming from? They're coming from me only. So all of us have this ability to connect with Swami. You don't have to be a great saint or a rishi. You don't have to be a sage. Everyone, this is a natural ability, just as easy as walking. But it takes some effort, and the effort is this. First, you have to be quiet. Many of us, especially in today's world, where we have our smartphones, our computers, our tablets, our uh, SMS messages, our gadgets, we are completely unaware of what it is like to be quiet. This quietness, this silence, is essential to the spiritual path. By silence, I mean an inner silence. The depth of this silence is what is required. And this is where most people fail when they try to tune into Swami. They're overcome by their doubts, their fears, their attachments, and especially their desires. But all of you can do this. You can learn to become quiet simply by tuning in. So I'm going to share with you a few techniques that you can do this, very practical, okay? So let's go over one of them. I've done this before with some of you in the hostel, but it's worth reviewing because it's one of the most powerful techniques. And Swami calls this the thumb meditation, okay? So all of you get out your thumb, 
We all have a thumb, right? And Swami says uh, that this thumb meditation is the essence of all forms of meditation, whether, whether it is vipassana, transcendental meditation, kriya yoga, whatever it is, every technique boils down into this. And Swami, this is what Swami taught to some devotees years ago. And again, he uh, discussed this in a discourse some four or five years back. So in this technique, what we do is we take our thumb and we simply watch it for 12 seconds. Okay? We'll do this several times and I'll take you deeper and deeper through each, each step. So let's take our thumb. When you're looking at your thumb, don't say, don't think thumb, thumb, thumb. Don't say side arm, side arm, side arm. Don't think, oh, I need to cut my nails. Just watch your thumb. Okay? That's all we're going to do. All right, so everybody have their thumb ready? I'll keep time for you, so you just have to watch and begin. So many of you, for a few moments, you had some little bit of silence. There were some thoughts here and there, that's okay. But what happens in this thumb meditation is you finally start to step, step into this quiet period. Now let's do it again. But this time what we're going to do is I'm going to ask you to allow yourself to be absorbed into the thumb, absorbed into the process of watching the thumb. So just it's as if you become the thumb itself. Okay, so let's go ahead and do this again. Everybody get their thumbs ready. And I'll give you count time again. And begin. And stop. See, much quieter this time. So this process of absorption is the essence of this type of meditation. You're allowing yourself to be absorbed by what it is you're doing. This is the key to my outer success. Simply by being absorbed in whatever task that I was doing, I learned to enter into a state of silence. And in that state of silence, I allowed Swami to do everything that needed to be done. I remember when I was in medical school in the United States, I had to take the national board exams, as they're called. They're required for every medical school student in the United States, and they're quite difficult. They're a two-day exam. And I, as I went through the exam, I was so tuned into the inner Swami that many times the answers would come even before I finished reading the question. And so I completed the exam entirely in this way. And at the end of the exam, several weeks later, when the results were announced, I found that not only had I been given the highest score ever in the history of my medical school, I received the gold medal for the overall country for that year. Now, don't clap, nothing big, because a few days later, Swami came in a dream and he said, you see, that was all my doing. He said, there's no way you could have gotten that kind of score on your own. So, this process of absorption, allowing yourself to be absorbed in whatever task is before you, is critical to success, not only in the worldly pursuits, but in your spiritual pursuits. The reality is that everything is spiritual because everything is God. But when we're studying for our exams, when we're preparing for our projects, when we're doing our work, being completely absorbed in the task at hand is critical. Otherwise, what do we all do? We, everyone, myself, we all do this. We will be working We'll be having a particular task at hand, but our mind will be someplace else, correct? We'll go this way, we'll go that way. Why did he say this? Why did they do that? And then we complete the task without really understanding what it is that we've done, or without having done a good job. We all have this in our studies, for example. All of you have had the experience of reading your textbook, right? And you will read two paragraphs, three paragraphs, maybe even an entire page, and then you suddenly realize you don't know what you've just read. Correct? This happens to everyone. Because you're not present, you're not absorbed in the task that is before you. So when I teach you this thumb meditation, it is simply to allow yourself to become completely absorbed in the task that you are doing. Does everyone understand this? Any questions or can I clarify anything more? 
Swami says that this thumb meditation is the essence of all forms of meditation. He, can say, he says, Ramana Maharshi used a star. Paramhansa Yogananda used a deepam, a light. Swami says, why your thumb? He jokes, because you carry it around with you wherever you go. If you do this for 12 seconds, that is like a muhurtam in yogic uh, parlance. If you do it for 12, that becomes dharana, one-pointed concentration. If you do it for 12 times 12 seconds, that is 2 minutes and 24 seconds, that becomes dhyana, meditation. If you do it for 12 dhyanas, that becomes samadhi. So this is the simple mathematics, the simple techniques that Swami has given us. And so I'd recommend that all of you practice this thumb meditation every day for 12 seconds. You all have 12 seconds free, right, during the day? So you can do this at, at your leisure. You can do it multiple times during the day. What I do is in my work, I will actually practice a thumb meditation as I'm working. I don't go like this because it is a little bit too obvious if I'm walking through the hospital. But what I will do is as I'm walking through the hospital, I'll simply focus on something on the floor or on the wall before me. And as I'm walking towards that for that 12 seconds or so, however long it takes, that becomes my meditation. In this way, I completely let go of the monkey mind. I let go of the thoughts. I let go of the burden of the ego and I become absorbed in that. When you become absorbed in that silence, Swami will speak to you loud and clear. He's waiting to talk to you. Just as much as you would like to have an interview with Swami today, that is the same desire, if not more, the same intensity with which Swami would like to speak with you. But it requires this effort of being silent. Now, once you are silent, boys will often ask, well, how do I know that it is really Swami who is speaking to me? This is a good question, no? Because the monkey mind is very subtle and the ego will very smoothly, it's like a smooth criminal, it will always put its own part into what you think you are receiving. And the answer is very simple. Suppose you get a phone call. You, all of you have mobile phones, no? Most of you. Huh? <laughs> Okay, so when somebody calls you on your phone, what is the very first thing that you do? You check to see who it is, right? Yeah? Okay, you check to see who is calling you. So also, when you get this inner guidance, the very first thing that you should do is check to see who is calling. Is it that arch criminal, the ego, or is it Swami? And you can just simply ask, who is this that is speaking? Who is this that is telling me this information? Just ask. If it is Swami really, then you will get a, sim a simple signal from inside. For me, it is a state of ananda, a state of peace, of expansion. For you, it may be something different. If it is the ego, you will get some long convoluted answer, or you may not get anything at all because the ego knows that it's been caught. That's very simple. The messages that you get from Swami will always be in accordance with what Swami physically would have told you, right? Swami's teachings are only love and selflessness, and that is the same guidance you will get from within. The guidance will never cause harm to you or to anyone else. So these are three simple things. But before you do this, practice this connecting to Swami when you are quiet, when you are healthy, not when you're tired or uh, feeling disturbed, when you are feeling peaceful and calm and you are free from agitation. The surest way to get distortion in Swami's guidance is to have desires or attachments to whatever it is you're asking about. Desires and attachments is like static that prevents us from getting Swami's messages clearly. So ask free of attachments, free of desires, connect to Swami in absolute silence. Okay. Let's do another simple technique. Okay. Let us close our eyes. You can sit up straight if you like. And we're just going to simply have an experience. We're not going to analyze anything. We're not going to think anything. We're just going to experience something. And what I'd like you to do for the next moment is to ask yourself, where do I begin? And where do I end? Look for an experience, not for a verbal answer. Where do I begin? And where do I end?
Very good. Let's come back to the present moment now. This, again, simple practice allows us to experience for a moment what we are, what we are. It's not the body, it's not the mind. Where do I begin and where do I end? You are beginningless and you are without end. But to experience this requires this simple effort. So the good news and the bad news is that first, all of this is very simple. The bad news is that it takes effort. Right? If it were so, e so easy, we all would have attained moksha many, many births ago. So the first part of this talk is how to connect to the inner side. And it begins with this very important step. First, by attaining silence. How do you attain silence? By the simple technique, the thumb meditation. You don't have to use your thumb. You can use a spot on the floor. You can use a spot on the wall. You can use a star in the sky. You can use Swami's photo. You simply allow yourself to get absorbed into whatever you're watching. You become that. Very simple, no? 12 seconds. All of you have 12 seconds free? Practice this every day. When you do this, Swami says, if you do this for three months continuously, at the end, you will have laser sharp concentration. Now imagine if in your studies, you had this type of concentration. You would be able to read a book once or maybe twice. And at the end, you would instantly know everything you need to be aware of. Right? Swami Vivekananda could do this. Remember, when he was young, he would read the entire Encyclopedia Britannica, which in those days was the collection of all contemporary knowledge. And he would be able to tell. He says, I can tell you which subject is on which page, and not only that, whether it's on the right or the left-hand side of the page. Such was his concentration. You can do the same thing through this simple technique. Thumb meditation, every day, 12 seconds. Okay. So how do we connect with Swami? First, we have to be quiet. The second part is we have to experience the universal sigh, the universal sigh. When Swami was physically present, it was so easy to just walk down to Darshan, sit in the cycle one hall, and then Swami would come. We would look for the line to form, and then we would look this way and that way. Is he coming? Is he not coming? And then we would have his Darshan. The same eagerness, the same excitement that you had when you were looking for Swami's physical darshan is the same that is required for looking for his universal darshan. Swami is here and there everywhere before us. There is no place that Swami is not present. He has simply removed his orange colored robe and donned the universal robe. And it is for all of us to find him. It is like a divine game of hide and seek in which Swami is hiding and we have to catch him. The wonderful thing is that we can catch him in every simple thing. When my son was young, when we were living in the United States, we were very close to nature. For us, being in nature was a simple way to be with God, and it was so refreshing to be out in God's beautiful nature, and we would do that whenever we had the opportunity. So when my son was only three or four years old, we would go out into the park, into the nat natural park actually, by the stream, and we would pick up a rock, and I would say, see this rock? God is in this rock. And he would pick up the rock and he would do like this, and he would look at it, but eventually he understood that God is in this rock. When the wind would blow, we would tell him, do you feel that wind blowing against your face? That is God telling you how much he loves you. And when the rain would fall upon us, I would say, do you feel that rain? That is God's tears of joy because he loves us so much. So in this way, although this was a way of speaking to a child, we can also understand that God is there here before all of us now. Let's do another simple exercise. So all of you sit up straight. And we're going to just simply ask a simple question. This is something you've heard before, but you've only reflected on it intellectually. We're going to ask ourselves, who am I? Who am I? We're not going to wait for a question. If you get an answer, you should then ask, who is this I that is having this experience? Who is this I that is receiving this question? And don't stop until you get the experience of who you are. Okay. Let's begin. Let's just simply settle in. Let's breathe deeply. Take three deep breaths in and out to settle your mind.
allow yourself to come into a state of quiet. And when you feel comfortable, ask, who am I? Very good. Let's come back now to the present moment. Ask yourself, who am I? Who am I? Who is this I that is a student? Who is this I that is sitting here or standing before you? Who is this I that is having this experience? And you will see that this I, the true I, and Sai are one and the same. This is the most important step in experiencing the universal side. I want to keep this talk simple and accessible to all, but at the same time I have to describe the truth, which is also very simple. And it goes like this. You see, we have so many books on spiritual topics, we have so many commentaries, we have so many Vedas, we have so many scriptures, and we're so fortunate to have all of these to refer to. But the whole truth is so simple, it can be summarized in just one or two paragraphs at most. And it goes something like this. You are not the body, you are not the mind, you are not the ego, your thoughts, or your experiences. Neither are you your memories. The true you, what you really are, is God. You are God having a dream experience in a dream body, in a dream creation. This whole creation is nothing more than a transient thought in your own mind. This entire creation is not creation, it is simply projection. Swami said this, he said actually there is no creation, only projection, just projection of the universal mind. To wake up from this dream, the only thing that is required is silence. Whether you achieve that silence through meditation, through service, through devotion, doesn't matter. But in the end, all three of these ways, bhakti yoga, karma yoga, dhyana yoga, raja yoga, will lead you to the end, silence. And in that silence, you will realize this simple truth. That is why we're all here. Right? Simple, no? It is simple, but not easy. It is simple. So the way to experience this universal Sai is to look for a Sai in everything as everything. Make it a game. For me, it is a game. When I get fooled, when I get taken in by the Maya, I say, ah, Swami, you got me again. And I make it a game with Swami, so that I'm always looking for him. I'm always trying to see if he allows, or rather if I allow, the veil of Maya to fall upon myself. If I'm looking at something good or looking at something not good, I still, my, I still, I still tell myself that it is all Swami, it is all Sai. The wind, the rain, the rock, the person who is sitting next to me, the experiences, for me, everything I make that my Sai. And in that way, I'm always connected to the universal Sai. And that connection to Swami is much greater even than having the physical form with us. When Swami was physically present, when we were living in Bangalore at his hospital there, we would come for darshan periodically. But what we found is that we were so attuned, that is myself and my, my wife, we were so attuned to Swami within that we would actually get confused when we would come for the physical darshan. It was so beautiful. His form is just enchanting. It was thrilling to be with Swami. And when Swami gave us those opportunities to speak with him, what bliss. But in that short period of time, we found ourselves going into separation, devotee and God. And so we would ask Swami, Swami, why is it like this? And he said to us, because Maya is so powerful around the physical form of the Lord. Now Swami has removed that thick Maya around his form and he's allowing us to see him for what he is, the universal Sai. So the second step to connecting with Swami is to have the darshan, to experience the universal Sai. That universal Sai is everywhere as everything. Once Swami 
in a, during an interview with my wife and I, Swami called and says, come here, I want to tell you a secret. So I thought, hey, Swami's going to tell us a secret? We both thought. Instantly, we both came closer to Swami, and Swami said, he, actually, there is nothing. And then he put his hand like this, and he did like this. He said, nothing really exists. And then he leaned back. This nothing is not an existential nothing. It is the absence of maya, the absence of name and form. Swami once said, name and form, all illusion. That is the same for Swami's form, for your form, for my form. The, the universal Sai is all that exists, and that's what you're here to experience. Connect with the universal Sai. That is the second part of my talk today. Now the third part is to delve deeper into the teachings of Sai. You see everywhere around you, even in the back and the front of this auditorium, we see Swami's teachings all around us. But do we really go deeper into the meaning? Let's take something very simple, Swami's principal teaching of love all and serve all. Swami once said, love all, serve all. This is the first teaching and this is the last teaching. Now interestingly, when we think of somebody being spiritually advanced or spiritually evolved, we say, oh, they can sit for meditation for so long. Oh, they have these abilities. Oh, they can do this and that. But the reality is that your level of spiritual evolution has nothing to do with any of this. Your spiritual evolution is simply measured by how much unconditional love do you have and how much selfless service are you constantly giving. This is love all, serve all. This is what determines an individual's level of soul evolution. It has nothing to do with their experiences or talents or abilities. Love all, serve all. So what does this mean? So what we do is we take Swami's teachings and we look at it very closely. We delve deeper into the teachings of Sai. So let me just discuss this with you. I'm still working on this. I'm not giving you the final answer, but I'm just giving you what I understand today. So love. What type of love? Is it an affection? Is it a kindness? Too often today, when we talk about compassion, especially compassion in healthcare, what we see is, is many hospitals advertising the care as compassionate care. But usually, what that means is that we will be nice to you as long as it is convenient. Right? That is actually what happens. That is not love. Love simply comes like the sunlight, regardless of whether there are clouds, whether you are inside a building or hiding in a cave somewhere. Love simply shines like light from the sun. That is the type of love, constant love. But how intense should this love be? When we would watch Swami, when Swami would interact with his devotees, we would see Swami see each person as if that person were the most beautiful thing he had ever seen, right? Many of you have seen this, those of you who were here when Swami was physically present has, have observed this. When Swami interacts, that person for him is the most beautiful thing. This is the type of love. Once during an interview, we asked Swami, I said, Swami, we see you love, but some, and we try to love like you love, but somehow we are not able to. This was during a family interview. So my wife was sitting in front of Swami, wife and son, and I was on Swami's side. Swami looked directly at my wife and said, because sometimes you are afraid. I asked in confirmation, I said, because we are afraid, Swami? And Swami nodded his head and turned to me, and he said, and because sometimes you forget. So why is it that we're not, afraid, we're not able to love like Swami loves? Because either we are afraid or because we forget. Why would we be afraid to love? Oftentimes it is because the ego gets in the way. Some, we have a certain understanding of how we are, right? How we should be. And it may not be convenient for us to love at that time. Many times what we do, however, is we acquiesce. We give in to the situation. We want to extend love, but the situation somehow, we're not able to overcome the inertia or the momentum of that situation, and we're not able to express Swami's love because we are afraid. The other reason is because we forget. We forget to love. But what would happen to us if the sun forgot to shine for one day? Right? What would happen to us if the wind stopped blowing for one day? What would happen to us if the trees stopped giving oxygen 
for one day? How would we survive? And in the same way, how do we survive without God's love? It's not possible. It is simply not possible. So let us get over this fear. Let us get over our amnesia. And let us give this love, this type of love, all the time. It's a constant practice. For me, it is constant. Once there was a great sage who asked Swami, Swami, for how long should we practice our sadhana? Now this sage was very highly advanced. And you know what Swami told him? He said, for as long as you are breathing, you have to practice your sadhana. As long as you are breathing, you have to practice your sadhana. So this loving, loving all, is a constant practice. Just as the sun is giving light all the time, so also should we give this love. Never afraid, never forgetting. So this is love. So there's still four, three more words left. Love all, serve all. This is how we delve deeper into each of Swami's teachings. We're not simply saying love all, serve all, brother. Okay, let's go, let's go play cricket. We are delving deeper into each and every aspect. Love all. What does that mean? This is again my interpretation. This is how I'm, we're working through each of Swami's teachings. Love all, to me, or when we usually say that, we, may seem, we usually mean, let me love my friends, let me love my hostel mates, let me love my family. Let me love Indians, but let me not love Pakistan. Right? This is how we usually think. But love all is different. This is a universal love. And I'll share a story with you to help you understand this. These were two very senior devotees, Janama and Kalasu Wintergate, who had this experience with Swami in 1968. So once Swami took both of their hands, they were very physically close to Swami for many years. Swami took both of their hands and he said, I'm now going to share with you something you must never forget. Swami said, in the end, when the body has turned to dust and everything is gone, the only thing that will matter is not how big of a house you had or what type of car you drove or how much money you had in your bank account. Swami said, the only thing that will matter is how much love you shared with all of creation in every single moment of your life. And Swami said it again, with all of creation in every single moment of your life. And then he put his hand like this and he said, the rest is byproduct. The rest is byproduct. The only thing that matters is how much love you have shared with all of creation in every single moment of your life. So when Swami says love all to us, that means loving all of creation, not just our friends, not just our family, not just India, not just the world, but the whole creation, the whole, whole, whole creation. This is the love that we constantly strive to give. If you practice this, you'll see that it's very simple. Let's do it now. Let's take you through a simple meditation again so that we can actually practice because one part is listening, but the other part is practicing. So let's again sit up straight and let us visualize you can think, feel, imagine, or f visualize that Swami is there before you. You can have Swami in whatever way you like. He can be sitting, he can be standing, it's up to you. But just see that Swami is there right before you. And try to feel as best you can that Swami is actually there. Think it, feel it, visualize, or imagine it. And just breathe in deeply for a few moments as you take in Swami's love from him to you. Just bask in Swami's love for you. And now let's extend Swami's love, your love, from you and him to this entire auditorium. Let's embrace everyone in this hall with this sweet divine love. And then let's extend that love to all of Puttaparthi, entire Prashantinilayam, extending it further to cover all of Andhra Pradesh, the entire state, all the people, the criminals, the crooks, the politicians, everyone is embraced by this divine love.
Let's extend it to the entire southern part of the country. Feel as if you're giving everything a great big hug of divine love. And extend that love further still to cover the entire country. Let's go further and further covering more and more of our continent, Asia. Spreading Swami's love across Europe and across all the continents until you are embracing the entire planet in this divine love. Feel as if you're just giving the tightest, most vigorous hug of divine love that you possibly could. Extend that love further and further still. Allow it to go through our solar system, embracing all the other planets, starting with Mercury all the way out, and including our sun. <coughs> giving all the beings who fill every square inch of this creation great big hug of love. And extend that love even further until you can embrace the entire galaxy. Feel like the galaxy is held in your hand and you're giving it great love. And now go further still until you are encompassing the entire creation. The whole creation has just been miniaturized and you are giving it a huge amount of love. All the universes, all the galaxies are there, so small and tiny, and you are giving it tremendous love. And now let's turn that love back on ourselves and let us love ourself, because if we cannot love ourselves, we will not be able to love others. And so let us love ourselves with that same intensity. And when we are full of that divine love, we become what Swami is, which is love itself. Very good. Let's slowly come back. So you see, it took us 10, 15 minutes just to discuss love all. We've not even started on the second part of serve all. I think because of time though, we'll have to end here. But I want you to understand these three simple steps. Let us review them. First, connect with the inner Sai. And what do you have to do? Let me hear from you. What do you have to do to connect with Swami? Yeah, be silent. Be silent inside. I'll give you a hint though. This is what I do in my practice. As a physician, even though I'm a doctor, I get so many phone calls from so many patients from the cardiac surgery, OT, they want me to come upstairs and see a patient, from somebody in OPD, they need help right away, somebody in the emergency room has just come and has a heart attack, I need to run there and, and resuscitate him, somebody in radiology is calling me for a scan. Sometimes I feel like I'm actually at a call center. My phone is ringing nonstop. It's just like that. So what do I do? How do I manage to maintain this type of awareness in all of that? How do I manage to stay silent? in all of that activity. And this is my technique. It's not the only one, but it may be useful to you. When I'm going about a particular task, and many times, many tasks at the same time, I will allow myself to be fully immersed in that task without thinking of anything else, neither the future nor the past, nor this other task that still is pending to be done. I will be thinking and aware only of that task. And once the task is done, I step out and I step right back into Swami. That's it. I'm in the operating theater. I'm assisting the surgeons with a difficult case. The patient may not be doing well. The patient's blood pressure may be almost zero. They need some help. I give the help that is required. I step out of the operating theater. As soon as I step out, I step right back into that silence. That is the secret. That's how I'm able to continue doing so many things but still remain absorbed by Swami, and in that silence, still remain connected to Swami. My mind is not going here and there. Will that patient recover? What will happen? How would I do? Did I do a good job? Could I have done better? Why did the surgeon do it this way? Couldn't he have done the operation this way? 
None of those things come to me. I simply go right back into that silence. This is a very important tip that I'm sharing with you. When you're going from your task to task, immediately absorb yourself into that task completely, whether it is playing sports, whether it is studying, whether it is chanting, singing bhajans, performing for a drama, whatever it is, completely absorb yourself in the task at hand. Swami does this all the time. Have you ever seen Swami look disturbed? Swami is always paced. He's always poised. He's always calm. Right? Because he's completely absorbed in whatever it is that he is doing. And this is a technique that you can also follow. The second tip was to experience the universal sigh. Remember the truth that you are God. Everything is God, and the only thing that you have to do to experience that is to become silent. Silence is obtained through seva, through devotion, through the path of wisdom. It doesn't matter, but they all, in the end, lead to that silence, which allows you to merge back into sai. And the third step is to delve deeper into the teachings of sai. We just picked one simple, the most basic, but the most important of Swami's teachings, love all, serve all. And just in discussing love all, you realize that there's actually much more to loving all than you thought. For most of us, loving all was just being nice, being when it was convenient. But that is not love. I hope you had a chance to experience what Swami, Swami's love really is like when we are really loving all. Serve all for me, for this is my personal interpretation. See, when we do service, we try to serve initially, initially in our growth, we serve when convenient. Okay, Saturday afternoon I will do my seva. Whatever it is, that's, that is okay. Then later we realize that service is what we want to do. For me, when I was 18 years of age, studying in the United States. During my first summer holidays as a college student in Stanford, I had, in those days, the, the typical pathway was that during your summer holidays, you would find a job that was in line with whatever career path you had chosen. So that way you would get experience in your work. Well, I was looking at what was available to me and none of it was, was relevant, and none of it was appealing. But I found something that was very different and very unusual. There was a charity, it was called Bike Aid, B-I-K-E, like bicycle, Bike Aid, A-I-D. And it was a charity in which a group of young individuals would bicycle across the United States, raising awareness and funds for grassroots level type of development work in the United States and across the world. So I joined this group called Bike Aid for that summer, and I bicycled some 5,000 kilometers across the United States, from San Francisco to Washington, D.C. At the end of the summer, I had legs that were like this big. You know, I was so strong. But what I had learned in that trip was one thing, and that all I wanted to do was to serve. I didn't know about Swami then. It was a year after that that I had learned about Swami. But all I knew was I wanted to serve all the time. And so for me, serve all means serving all the time, always giving, 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 never taking. But it also means, later I've understood, that serve all means serving everything, every aspect of creation. Initially we serve just the people that are around us, but then we, through giving and giving more love, giving and giving more light, Swami's love and light, we are serving all of creation through this practice, our constant sadhana. Remember, as long as you are breathing, you have to practice your sadhana. So love all, serve all. This is just one teaching. Swami's teachings are so many. So delve deeper into the teachings of Sai, and this will bring you closer to Sai. So with that, I'll end my talk for this morning. Uh, if there are some questions from the students or the teachers, I'd be happy to take them to the best of my ability. Thank you. Sai Dam. Yes, sir, please. A sound bank balance. That is a good question. I can share my own experience with you. Yes. So I was in the United States. I was working at a hospital called the Cleveland Clinic, which is, has been for many years the number one hospital for heart care in that country. The, 
we had 90 cardiologists in our group, huge number, 90 cardiologists, 15 cardiac surgeons. Most hospitals in comparison will have three, four cardiologists. My patients were the King of Jordan, uh, the Prime Minister of some Uzbekistan, all the, all the stands in Western uh, Russia, no, they would all come to us. Uh, those type of people, the who's who of society. Our salary was quite comfortable by, by modern Indian standards. It was less than what I would have gotten in private practice because the Cleveland Clinic is an academic hospital, but it was still quite good. We rode a big car, we had a big house, we had lots of luxuries. We, because I was speaking and traveling all over the world as part of my work for the Cleveland Clinic because of my expertise, I was always staying in five-star hotels and so forth. But then one day, I got an email this was just one of those uh, emails from the Satya Sai Samiti in our area. And the email was advertising for the position of a interventional cardiology fellow that is training someone who's completed cardiology residency and is doing their training in cardiology. So I have already been trained, I've already done, so that wasn't relevant to me. But at the bottom of that email, there was one sentence and it said, Positions for consultant cardiologists are also available, and you should apply by such and such date. Just that one sentence at the bottom of the mail. I immediately saw that. I was struck by a thunderbolt. I called my wife. She was working at the time, so I couldn't reach her. I had to go and see patients. What to do? Pa duty is always there. I went in and uh, was seeing patients up on the hospital inpatient ward. And I, my wife called me back and I just excused myself from the other fellows and the nurses that I was working with and took the phone call uh, in a side of the, the hospital ward where I could have some privacy. And I said, you know, I just saw an email. There's an opening for a consultant cardiologist at Swami's Hospital in Bangalore. What do you think? You know what her response was? She said, now this is, she's at work, I'm at work. She says, of course, let's go. And that was it. There is nothing like, well, what do we do about the house? You know, this was around 2007, 2008. The economic disaster of, the, of that time had, had just started. Housing prices were plummeting. We had just bought a house. The house cost us five lakh dollars. That's a lot of money. That's like a couple of core rupees, you know? And uh, we had a big car. We had two cars, actually. And we had all these things. And we, but we didn't think, well, if we sell our house, we'll have to sell it for a loss. Uh, what will our son do? Well, our son will go to Swami school, of course. Okay, where will we work? What will she do? We didn't think any of those things. We just came home, we spoke, we knew that we were going, and then within a few months, we had come to Puttaparthi, we had spoken to Swami. Swami indicated, yes, come, this is what I want for you. And a few months after that, we sold everything, everything, and moved here. So the question is, do you have to have a big bank balance? Actually, we lost most of our savings in coming here because of the economic downturn at that time. But I will tell you that we are far wealthier than we have ever been at any point in our lives because we have Swami. Yes, sir. And, sir, do you have a question? Very good question, thank you. So everybody look at their arm, okay? I'll just show you very, very simply. Everybody look at their hand. You see so many hairs on your hand, right? Each hair has its own experience. Each hair is separate from the other one. Yet is one hair separate from the other, really? Each one has its own experience, yet each is part of the same. Each is part of you, right? So just like that, although there may be six billion people on this planet, the reality is that those are just six billion parts of yourself. They are not separate from you. They are not different from you. 
this is what love all brings you to. It allows you to experience that you and all six billion, plus all the creatures, plus all the trees, plus all the everything, is yourself only. It's very interesting. Love will show you that you are everything. Love will show you that you are everything. Wisdom will show you that you are nothing. This is what Swami was telling us when he said, I want to tell you a secret. And then just as if he was like a little kid, he was saying, actually, nothing really exists. Love and wisdom are simply two sides or two aspects of the same coin. So don't see anyone as separate from yourself. When I love all, I'm loving them as if they are myself, because that is what they are. This question from, from the, what is this, the galleys, or this is where bad kids are kept? Please. Can I share some light on Swami's return? I knew this question was going to come. <laughs> You know, I don't know, to be honest. I don't know. And any of us who are speaking are probably making an educated guess. So the answer is, can I share some light on, the question is, can I share some light on Swami's return? I don't know. I'm sure that many of you, just like, uh, just like myself, I'm sure that many of you have had dreams, I have, in which Swami has said, I'm okay, I'm coming back. But I'll tell you that how Swami or what Swami means when he says, I'm coming back, how, when, and in what form, I don't know. I do believe, though, that if Swami does come back, it won't be in the same way or manner that he had been before. That means the door opens in Yajraman there, the line forms, Swami comes on his chair, he goes around the hall, he takes some letters, he speaks to a few people, he goes for interview, he comes out, he takes, Darsha, he takes uh, Arati, then goes back in. Those days are gone. Just as the days when Swami would take a group of devotees down to the Chitravati river, they would sing bhajans. Swami himself would lead the bhajans and then in the end, he would put his hand into the sand and pull out some sweets or some idol or something to give to the devotees. Those days have not come for many, many years. So when we talk about Swami coming back, we should expect the unexpected. We should expect that Swami is watching us here right now, he is watching us at every single moment, and he is looking, he is waiting for us to grow, he is waiting for us to recognize that we, we talk about Swami coming back, for me, it is the Sai within. When we connect to the Sai within us, then Swami is back already. We have no need to wait for some external miracle. I'll share with you something else that Swami once said. And this is very important for all of you to understand. Swami said once, he said, creation is so designed that nothing in creation will ever give you satisfaction. If you look at this, just contemplate on this for a moment, you'll see that this is true, right? If I were satisfied with being at the Cleveland Clinic, my chairman, Dr. Stephen Nissen, who's a world-renowned cardiologist, said that I was one of the up-and-coming superstars. My colleagues would joke that, boy, the way you are, you're going to be chairman within five, ten years. If I were so content, why would I have left? Right? Is there anything in, in creation that can, can, can give us contentment or satisfaction? No. This is what Swami says. Creation is designed so that nothing will ever give you satisfaction. But then Swami added another statement. He said, not even your own Swami. Not even your own Swami. Why? We've had Swami with us for 86 years, 85 plus years, yet we're still not content. Why? Because we are looking outside of ourselves. So when you ask me, is Swami coming back? My response is, why are you looking outside of yourselves for Swami? when Swami is right there, inside of you, right now, giving you darshan, but your eyes are closed. Do you understand? Yes? It's very important you understand this. Nothing in creation will ever give you satisfaction, will ever, content, will ever give you contentment, not even Swami. Only when you turn within and find the Lord inside of yourself will you get that satisfaction. Connect with the inner side.
So with that, I think we'll, we'll end. Is that time is up? Yeah. Okay, let's go ahead and end. And thank you all for your time and attention. Side on to you all. Om Shri Sai Ram. I offer my most humble obeisance at the lotus feet of our beloved Bhagwan, respected elders, and my dear brothers. Today it is my honor to draw the curtains for this morning's proceedings. If I were to sum up in two sentences about Dr. Srikant Sola's presentation, this morning, I would say it is a wake-up call that brings to light that we are not human beings having a spiritual experience, but spiritual beings having a human experience. Thank you, sir, for this timely reminder. We are extremely grateful to you for spending your valuable time with us. And we look forward to such interactions in the near future. Thank you so much. Sairam.